So friends, while the team is taking their seats, why don't you please turn to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to read some selected verses from Matthew 2. And we're going to read from verse 1. It's a familiar story as it always is. Uh, And we're going to just read the story of the Magi and the escape to Egypt. So after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. When Herod called the Magi, then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And then the next verses tell of how they did that. And I want to move to verse 13. When they had gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. And so he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Just so far, may God bless his word to us. Amen. Let us bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? Lord, we just thank you for this blessed day, this day that we can celebrate your birth. We can come together like the shepherds of old, like the magi of old, and bring our worship to you. And we pray that through your word this morning that you would speak into our hearts, that you would open our minds to the reality of this Christmas and what it truly means for us. And so bless your word in our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen? You're all there. Because it's like I can hardly hear a murmur from up here. Okay, so now we, for those of you who've been with us over the past couple of weeks, we have been sharing a brief series that I've entitled The Word, and we've looked at the who of the word and the how of the word. And today, we are really going to be focusing on the why of the word. And I've simply entitled this the, the, the real version of Christmas. And I've asked the question... What would the Christmas story be with no stable, with no manger, no Joseph, no Mary, no Bethlehem, no shepherds, no angels, no star, no wise men, no baby? It would really be the account that John gives of the Christmas story that we've been looking at over these last two weeks from John 1, 1 to 14. That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
As I've also said, I understand that many of these elements that I've mentioned that make up the Christmas story are very charming and sentimental, but they are really those that stand in stark contrast to the ugliness and the, and the messiness that we see in the real world as we approach the end of another year. And maybe for this year, it has been really messy. Maybe there's been sickness. Maybe there's been bereavement, pain, guilt, financial difficulty, divorce, bad choices, regrets, depression, loneliness, and so many other things, so many unfulfilled expectations. But it turns out the most unsentimental version of the Christmas story is actually found in the Bible itself. And over the past two weeks, we've seen that it is found in John's Gospel, but it's also found in other parts of the Gospels, but that it really gets any mention at this time of year. We tend to stay away from some of these details that writers like Matthew certainly didn't stay away from. And I want to look at some of these details. And as we do, we get to answer the question, why would the Bible include these elements of pain and sorrow and anguish? What did it mean for the characters in the story? And what does it mean for you and for me? And we're going to be looking at Matthew 2, and we read some of the verses a moment ago. And this is the way Matthew begins this part of the Christmas story. He begins after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod. The key phrase there is, during the time of King Herod. That's not just a calendar statement. Jesus is born at a time when Herod had been given the title King of the Jews by the Roman Senate, who had appointed him as such on the recommendation of Mark Antony. He wasn't the rightful king of Judah. He wasn't in the Davidic line, as we know Jesus was from Matthew chapter 1. He was, in fact, an incredibly cruel and wicked man. He had been married to 10, some say 11 wives. He became suspicious of the only one he ever loved. Her name was Miriam. And so, because of some petty jealousy, what did he do? He had her executed. And then he had her mother executed. And then he had his own two sons executed. He also had all his predecessors who were still alive murdered. He literally taxed the poor in Israel into homelessness. And that's part of why there was so much rebellion in the day. Herod was not a true Jew. He was an Edomite, which was a descendant of Esau. And you'll remember the story in Genesis 25, that right before these two brothers were born, Jacob and Esau, they were already fighting in the, mother of their, in the womb of their mother. There was a great battle that has gone down through the ages. That even began before these two brothers were born, Jacob and Esau. This great king, Herod, so-called, was a descendant of Esau. Now, in the light of this today, we have in the birth of Christ to a nation which was ruled by a wicked half-Jew who descended from Esau, none other than the great universal struggle that has always existed in this universe, the struggle between the spiritual and the carnal, the struggle between the worldly and the godly, the struggle, as it were, between God and the devil. Herod was the one who built the great temple in Jerusalem. He was known as Herod the Great, great builder of cities. But he had placed on the temple a golden eagle. This was considered a pagan symbol deeply offensive to many in Israel. 
And so a group of people snuck in in the night and tore the golden eagle down. And Herod had all the suspects rounded up. He had them all executed. And those that he thought were ringleaders, he burned alive at the stake. History records that he died a horrible death. He was in such agony that he actually tried to commit suicide five days before he, he actually died. A god stopped him. There was a lot of noise and confusion through the, throughout the palace on that, at that time. Another son of his, who was now the crown prince, had been told that his father, Herod, had died, and so he immediately sought to assume power. The problem was, Herod was still not dead. And when he heard about this, on his deathbed, he had his son executed. I'm not making this up. He died five days later. He knew that because of the nature of his reign, no one would shed too many tears over his death. So what he actually did is he left instructions in his will that scores of prominent Israelites were to be rounded up and executed on the day he died because he wanted there to be weeping in the streets on the day that he died. Josephus, the Roman historian, wrote, and I quote, Herod never stopped avenging and punishing every day those who chose to party to his enemies. What a time to be born. Jesus was born in the time of this evil, wicked King Herod. This account not only shows us as a microcosm of Judaism in the contemporary day in which Jesus was born, but it shows us a microcosm of the whole of the Christian era. From that hour that Jesus was born, that self-same homage and hatred have existed for him as the Son of God. It's no different today. And we might rightly ask the question today that the wise men asked back then, where is the king? Where is he in the eyes of nations and states, in the eyes of politicians and presidents and rulers? And whilst there is still a remnant of people like us, like the Magi, who come and bring homage to Jesus at this time, the fact of the matter, friends, is that there are countless others out there who still reject him, even as they rejected him at his birth. He is still exiled from the hearts and homes of so many men and women in this world. Proverbs 21, 1 to 2 says, In the Lord's hand, the, heart, the king's heart is a stream of water that he channels toward all who please him. A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. So we carry on reading. The next part of the story is about the Magi, a story we've heard so many times before. Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who's been born? Notice the title, King of the Jews. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And we read, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. No kidding, he was disturbed. And we know why. We know what kind of man this is. And when Herod is disturbed, everyone is disturbed. Herod wanted to make sure this potential rival would be eliminated. But he's thwarted in his attempts to find out precisely which baby boy born in Bethlehem was born king of the Jews. Meanwhile, while this is going on, in the midst of all of it, an angel comes to Joseph and says to him, get up, take your child and his mother and escape to Egypt, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Now think about how this first Christmas was for Joseph. 
He had already lost his integrity, his reputation as a righteous man, because he was marrying a woman who everybody knew was already pregnant. And Joseph is now being told that he's about to lose a lot more than that. God tells him, Joseph, you'll, you'll lose your home. You'll lose your job, your people, your country. You're going to have to take your wife and small child who's dependent on you and live as a refugee, a fugitive in a hostile country. And yet we know that all the time, and this is important, we know what God was up to. He was up to something in Joseph's life. He was up to something in this family's life. And maybe you've been questioning some of the things that have happened in your life recently. Then this unsentimental version of Christ's birth is a reminder that if you are his child, he is never far from you. That he's always up to something in your life as well. And Joseph would one day understand precisely why God intervened, why God sent him to Egypt. God's purpose was unraveling in his life and in the life of his son. And God's purpose is unraveling in your life, even if at the time you do not understand it. And so we continue to read, when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. The voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Herod is merciless. Sends soldiers into Bethlehem to break into every home. We sing Christmas carols like, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Friends, Bethlehem was anything but still when Herod came for Jesus. This part of the story that became known as the slaughter of the innocents, interesting phrase when you think about the life and death of Jesus. This is nothing like what we are taught in the multi-billion dollar Xmas sentimentalized industry that celebrates this event. One thing we know for sure, when Jesus was born, all was definitely not calm. All was definitely not bright. This little baby did not sleep in heavenly peace. There was a price on his head. When our children were small, and now our grandchildren, they participated in Christmas pageants every year. And as we know, they all dress up in sheets and bathrobes, pretend to be Joseph and Mary and the shepherds and the wise men and the innkeeper and so on. And I'm sure we've all been to such pageants. But somehow this part of the story never made its way into those pageants. It is these parts of the story. It is these parts, indeed, in our world and in our lives that really cause us to ask the question, where is God? Lord, why are you allowing this? I don't understand. Something must be done. Surely, God, you're going to do something. Surely, God, you're going to intervene. And that is precisely the message of Matthew, friends. Matthew is telling us, you're right, something has to be done. Something has been done. But it's something no one would have expected. And maybe as you come here this morning, you know all about pain and suffering. Maybe you've experienced a loss that has left you vulnerable and broken. Maybe there'll be an empty chair around your table this year that has never been empty before and it's breaking your heart. Maybe it's a child who's run away from you or from God and your heart is grieving for him or her. And Joseph would come to you and me this morning and say, don't give up. Don't give up. 
because God has not given up on you. The picture we are given of Jesus' first coming conveniently overlooks the fact that he came to this world during the reign and the terror of an evil king. Even at a time when Rome herself was enjoying peace, Pax Romano, for the first time in centuries from her enemies. And yet this scene is anything but peaceful. But let's look at another part of Jesus' story that doesn't get into many pageants. He is taken to the temple on his eighth day. And there an old man called Simeon is there and holds this little baby up and pronounces a blessing over him. It's really a, a poignant moment. And Simeon says, Now, sovereign Lord, dismiss your servant in peace. I have seen the salvation I've been waiting for. I've held him in my arms. I can die a happy man. And of course, Mary and Joseph are, are basking in, in this blessing. And he blesses them, and we're told they marvel at what he says. But then he has one more thing to say. And he turns to Mary, and he looks her in the eyes, and he says, just imagine hearing these words. If you're Mary, the mother of Jesus, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. What odd words. What did this mean to her? Imagine receiving a card of congratulations for the birth of your, your son, with a cute little picture of the baby on the front of the card, and inside you read the words, your baby is happy, healthy, and smart, but he will pierce your soul, he will shatter your heart. A sword is going to pierce your soul, Mary. And we all know that it did. And every time it was Jesus' birthday, can you imagine? Mary remembering the birthdays of countless other families in Bethlehem who would never celebrate their son's birth because of the slaughter of the innocents, because of Jesus. I've often wondered how Jesus felt about that when he grew up and learned what had happened, knowing that had his life been offered, had his life been given, it might have saved so many other babies at that time. But you see, this was not the right time. It was not the Kairos time. His life would be given to save far more than just those children in Bethlehem and its vicinity in Herod's day. He began his life as he would end it, with someone in power wanting him dead. Now another thing I want to bring to your attention we sang about it early on this morning. How often at Christmas do we hear all the titles and wonderful names of Jesus? Emmanuel, Messiah, Son of Man, Son of God, Lion of Judah, Rose of Sharon, and so on. But there's one biblical title you seldom see highlighted, except by Matthew, starting in verse 8. Make a careful search for the child, the place where the child was. They saw the child with his mother. Take the child and escape to Egypt. And so he got up and took the child. Take the child and go to the land of Israel. And so he got up and took the child. In his references to the child, we have so many references in this one or two verses. Why? Because in the ancient world, they were not particularly sentimental about children. The odds, in fact, of a child growing up to adulthood 
were not great. To be a child was to be dependent, to be defenseless, to be fragile, to be vulnerable. And yet this was the child who would save his people from their sins. But he's not saving anybody now. Jesus is God made utterly vulnerable. Jesus is God rendered completely defenseless. Jesus is God exposed to all the evil that the world could offer that it might do its worst to him. And his only response would be to suffer. And as we saw last week when we looked at the how of the word, Jesus made himself vulnerable. God made himself vulnerable coming into the world as a child, as a baby. And friends, if this Christmas you feel vulnerable, if you feel weak, if you feel helpless, if you feel at the end of your tether, if you don't feel like you have enough strength in you to make life look like the sentimental pictures of Jesus born in a manger and all these other symbols that make Christmas into such a charming and sentimental event, then remember again that Jesus has been there. And later in his life, as he grew up, and when you think about it in the light of his own life, it becomes far more remarkable when he said these words, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's the message to us, friends. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you become vulnerable, unless you become dependent, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus changed and became a child. God is at work in real deep ways in Bethlehem, in Israel, in Egypt, in your life, in mine. This is part of Matthew's wonderful, dark, deep story. Part of what he wants us to know is that no trial, no expression of evil goes on forever. Listen now. So in verse 19 of Matthew 2, the next season of Jesus' life is introduced with this phrase. After Herod died. The chapter begins during the time of King Herod, but then later it says, after Herod died. In fact, Matthew mentions the fact that Herod is dead three times in chapter 2 alone. So what does Matthew want us to know? Herod is dead, he says. It's over. Think about it. Herod could have been one like John the Baptist, welcoming and proclaiming Jesus as the King of Kings born into this world. That is what we might have expected since he was, after all, half Jewish. He was the builder of the temple. He was the defender of Jerusalem. And yet he didn't. And the Magi, on the other hand, who were pagan astrologers from a distant eastern land, are the very ones you would not expect to worship Jesus. And yet they do. They travel thousands of miles to find this one born king of the Jews. And Matthew wants us to see this picture, these two pictures as it were. That there are those today who will bring homage to Jesus and there are those today who will offer their hatred. Yet at the end of the day, Matthew also wants us to know that Herod the Great with his crown, with his wealth, with his pomp, with his power, with his glory, that Herod is dead. And ultimately, friends, this is what we all will face. And how we respond to the question of Jesus is probably the most important question that you'll ever need to respond to in this life. Herod says, I want to be king. I want to be remembered as Herod the Great. And these wise astrologers, 
the very ones that the world would normally look up to are the ones who go and bend the knee and offer homage to the King of Kings. Friends, there's a road that will drive you to your knees. And there's a road that will put yourself on the throne that will ultimately lead to a grave with no hope beyond. Herod died. Who else is going to die? It's not a trick question. All of us. And Matthew is sending a clear message. And he's saying, when was Jesus born in Herod's time? In a time of evil and suffering and wickedness. But remember one thing, Herod will die. He's Herod the Great. And at the beginning of the chapter, Matthew deliberately calls him that three times. The king, King Herod. And then the Magi go, they offer their gifts, they give their worship to Jesus. And it is like the coronation of a king. And now we discover who the real king is and who the real king has been all the time. And it's from that point onwards in Matthew's story, go and look at it. Matthew never calls Herod king again. There's a new king in town. There's a new king who's come into the world. In the last week, We've been reading Dr. Sears' stories to the children. And I remember John Ortberg sharing an illustration from one of his books called Yertle the Turtle. It's about a little pond of turtles that is ruled, or so he thinks, by Yertle. And one day he decides that his kingdom needs extending, like all kings. And he comes up with his little rhyme, Dr. Zeus' style. I'm king, he said, of all that I see, but I don't see enough. That's the trouble with me. And it came to pass, there went out a decree from Yertle the turtle, that all the turtles should be stacked up to be his throne, to extend his power and his glory. The king lifts his finger and the whole pond scrambles to obey. First dozens, then hundreds of turtles, and he could see for miles. I'm Yertle the turtle, O oh marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. Yertle Augustus. And he thought his throne was as secure as a throne could be. But in the end, it turns out, to be like a Tower of Babel. And we carry on reading, for the turtle on the bottom did a plain little thing. He burped. And that burp shook the throne of the king. And today the great Yertle, that marvelous he, is the king of the mud. That's all he can see. You see, friends, Jesus said, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Even if you're Yertle Augustus, even if you're Yertle VIP, MVP, PhD, CEO, you're just one little burp from disaster. And so let me ask you, as we bring this to a close, Whose kingdom are you building? Are you like Herod trying to build your own kingdom over which you can have control? And maybe today for you will be that little burp that wakes you up to reality, wakes you up to who the real king ought to be of your life. And I want to close with a quote from one of my favorite authors, Brennan Manning. I'm not sure if you can really see it up there. It's quite small, but listen to this. I think these words are so profound. God is in charge. 
He uses all the cacophony of human frenzy. He laughs at our plans, silently, unobtrusively, unseen, unheard. He works out purposes that shake and rattle and roll and turn our world upside down and inside out. We build our little kingdoms and call other people to come and look at them and see them and go, wow. And then they crumble into dust, and God uses the rubble of human disaster to build a kingdom of redeemed beauty in unimagined splendor. God is in charge. He is so in charge that he can use evil kings. In fact, he is so in charge that he can use evil kings even without their knowing it. And the foundation on which he is building his redeemed world is lying in a manger in Bethlehem. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's Jesus. A few weeks back, somebody asked me, what are you doing this Christmas? And I told him that we probably wouldn't be celebrating Christmas because children are immigrating today, as you know, and we'll be heading off to the airport and say we'll do Christmas on the 22nd and gave them the whole rundown. But I was really tempted to say to them when they asked, what are you doing this Christmas? Nothing. I can do nothing because it's already been done. You see, it's not about how you do Christmas, friends. It's not how you do Christmas. It's about how he did Christmas. Amen? It's about how he did Christmas. It's about how he came into this world. And if we eliminate all the fanfare and all the embellished stories that we have from Scripture and we're left with the stark details that we've looked at, some of which we've looked at today, we realize that it's really that version of Christmas that's the most relevant at this time. That's the real version of Christmas. God who became vulnerable, who became like us, the God who can identify with your pain and your suffering and all that you go through, because that's really the story that we need to hear at this Christmas time in a world, we are chatting about it last night, in a world that is, just seems to be unraveling even as we speak, a world that is becoming darker and darker, a world that is becoming more and more godless. The story that we need to really share with people is that Jesus actually came into a world like that. And because he did, he can identify with what we go through. And so may God bless you this day. May God bless you in the coming year. May God continue to remind us what the real version of Christmas is. And may that carry us through in the months that lie ahead. God bless you all. Let's bow in a moment of prayer. Lord, we just thank you that the real version of Christmas is sometimes lost in the story of the stable and the shepherds and the angels and the stars in the pageants that we attend, that the real version of Christmas is still penned in Scripture, but it's an ugly story. But it's a story that is not too different from the world in which we live. It's a story that we can identify with. It's a story that reminds us, as it did Joseph, that God is never that far from us, that He is indeed Emmanuel with us. And Lord, whatever we've been through, and I know that there are many here who've been through some really hard times this year, and many of us who will go through similar hard times in the coming year, Lord, may we hold on to the truth that the very real meaning of Christmas is that you came into this world as a child and that you would suffer for our sin and that you would give us life, life in abundance that this life is not all that there is, 
that there is a glorious life beyond that you came to reveal to us. And so we pray, Lord God, even as we go away, as we celebrate at our different Sunday lunch table or Monday lunch tables, Christmas lunch tables, that, Lord, we would not forget the real version of Christmas. Bless every family represented here today, Lord, and may your name be glori glorified even in our celebrations, we ask, in the precious name of our Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.